as beautiful as it is, you must learn how to live that covenant out in your everyday life. And so we began from giving. And we looked at two major types of giving because it's a bit controversial. The first fruit giving and the giving of tithes. And there were a few things we resolved from that subject. The first thing we resolved from the subject of first fruit and tithe is that in the context of the new covenant, you don't pay tithe, you give tithe. And it means a lot. It means that when you are giving your tithe, you are not obeying a law that if you don't do, you will be cursed. You are not obeying a law that if you don't keep, a devourer will kill you. You are not obeying a law that if you don't keep, you will go to hell. All of that has been handled. I don't need to try to avoid cost. I am blessed. Because I am blessed, I cannot be cursed. The Bible said in Galatians 3, 13, 14, 18 and 19, that Christ has been made a cost for us. Cost is everyone that hangeth on the tree that the blessings of God may come upon, not just the Jews now, but even the Gentiles. And remember, when Balaam wanted to curse Israel, the Bible said you can't curse him that the Lord has blessed. But there's no enchantment against Jacob. There's no divination against Israel. So I'm not paying tithe to avoid the cost. I'm giving tithe for a superior purpose. Number two, no devourer can destroy anything about me because the authority to rebuke the devourer is no longer in heaven. It's with me. He say, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You go in that power. He say, in my name, cast out devils. He say, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and power, above every name and every dominion that is mentioned. So any devourer that comes in the name of Jesus, I will rebuke that devourer. I don't need to wait for God to rebuke any devourer. I have the authority in Christ Jesus to rebuke devourer. And finally, I'm not going to hell because I don't pay tithe. Because tithe was not part of the contract of salvation. Jesus paid the price to save me. My job is to believe him and confess him as Lord. So long as my faith in Christ is intact and I reaffirm him as my Lord and Savior, I have a an express ticket to go to heaven. And when I appear before the judgment seat, nobody will ask me about tithe. The question that will be asked is whether the life of God is in you. Because the book that will be open for salvation is the book of life. And the Bible said, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. That life is in his son. Whoever had the son has life. Whoever had not the son has not lied. He said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son that you may know that you have eternal life. So I'm not afraid of hell because I know that I've been redeemed from condemnation. So why then do I give tithe? My tithe is an act of honor to God. I see God as my Lord. I see God as my Savior. So anything that comes to me, I must of necessity in the spirit of honor, take a portion out of it and honor the Lord. So I give it as an act of honor. Number two, why do I give my tithe? I give it as an act of worship because I acknowledge God to be my source. Although I'm working in the bank, but the bank is not my source. I acknowledge God to be my source. So if I receive from God, it's only right that I show gratitude. Why do I give my tithe? Number three, I give my tithe as an act of consecration because now I belong to God. So anything that is mine must be consecrated to God. The same way I give my time in serving God because I now belong to God. For me, for instance, serving God in the house of God is not a choice. It is now what I do from the revelation that I belong to God now. So there's a portion of my time, there's a portion of my energy that is allocated to serving God. That's how my resources too are allocated to serve God because I belong to God and so I consecrate even my resources to God. Why do I give tithe and first fruit and offerings? Number four is because I love the Lord. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. I cannot love God and everything that comes to me, something does not leave it to God. So all our offerings, our first fruit, our tithing and all our givings are designed for purposes superior to the things that are captured in the law. Whereas we say Although it is that way, the law is still not caught up because the law helps us to understand the administration of tithe. Because when the tithe comes in, there is an administration that governs it. Number one, we say the administration of tithe is for the welfare of the priest. Because the priest is supposed to be a man separated unto God who has no inheritance. So God designed it that way that when tithe comes in, it will be used for the welfare. And every church organization you see today, a large percentage of the priesthood or of the ministers are literally doing nothing. They are serving God. So for them not to be stranded while serving God, a portion of the tithe is kept for their welfare. That's why the tithing cannot be abolished. Otherwise, priesthood engagement will be truncated. Number two, we said the tithing is also for the administration of orphans, widows, and strangers. Because there are many orphans amongst us. This is one of the places people can come to and hope they will be blessed unconditionally. That's what the church is for. It's the house of God. So when orphans come here, when widows come here, and when there are strangers around us, there has to be a portion where we remove from to cater for their welfare until they are able to stabilize. So the beauty of the Old Testament and the reason why the Old Testament is relevant is the fact that it gives us insight into the administration of tithe. So from the perspective of the gospel, we know that the tithe is not abolished. Jesus said so in Matthew 23, 
23, but he said it's not a major issue in the kingdom. He said, consider faith, consider righteousness, consider justice. These are serious matters. However, don't neglect this. So we don't neglect it because it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate financial consecration. It gives us an opportunity to honor the Lord. It gives us an opportunity to show worship through our resources. It gives us an opportunity to acknowledge God as our source and so many others that I have mentioned. And apart from that, it also gives us enablement to bring administration to financial matters in the kingdom of God. But we know that we are doing it freely. We are doing it from the place of free will. No compulsion. Because in the New Testament, we are blessed, we are empowered, and we are saved eternally. So there is no fear. So when you look at the whole subject, summarily speaking, it represents your maturity in grace. When you mature in your understanding of grace, you will tight. Not because you are afraid, but because it holds a more superior essence. Everything I taught, I taught it from the standpoint that our goal is not to fault the fathers who may have taught contrary things. The revelations they have and what they have taught is what God gave them for their generation. What God is telling us now is for our own generation. If we preach what we are preaching now in their generation, they may stone us. And if they preach what they are preaching in our own generation, it may not be received. Because revelation is progressive and the dealings of God is also dispensational. So God is moving. So what we teach is an update from what they have taught. After all, they were the ones that led us to Christ. We didn't wake up and say, now we need to know Jesus, we are wise. No, it is what they taught us that brought us here. But now that they have raised us, God is adding more syllables to what he has done before. So this is not an attempt to start pointing and say, hey, this pastor said this one. That one. No, we are dealing with different generations. They have served their own generation. It's our time to serve our own generation. And this is the revelation God is giving us. The generation that will come after us, we know the ones that we have not known. From the same scripture we are reading. And they will bring things out. We'll be shocked. Was this thing there? Because they also have their own revelation for their own generation. What's the one thing holding you back from living the life God has called you to? I bet it's fear. Fear that whispers, you're not enough, you can't do it, you'll fail. But what if I told you, God never intended for you to live in fear? In fact, he has given you everything you need to overcome it. Today, we're going to talk about how to break free from the chains of fear and walk in the boldness that God has already placed inside of you. And it all starts with one thing, faith. Let's dive in. Fear is something we all face. It can be paralyzing, overwhelming, and even make us doubt God's promises. But here's what we need to understand. Fear is not from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let that sink in for a moment. Fear is not your identity. Power, love, and a sound mind are. Fear doesn't get the final say in your life. God's power does. I know some of you are watching this right now feeling like fear has gripped every area of your life. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of the unknown. But here's the good news. Jesus is greater than your fear. When you feel anxious or afraid, you're not meant to carry that weight alone. In fact, Jesus invites us in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Fear can weigh you down. It can make you feel like you're carrying a burden too heavy to bear. But God is saying, come to me. Give that fear to me and I'll give you peace. When you put your trust in God, you start to realize that he's bigger than your fears. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 reminds us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is literally promising that you don't have to do it alone. He's holding you up even when the fear feels overwhelming. What if instead of focusing on your fears, you started focusing on God's promises? Practical steps to overcome fear. So how do we practically overcome fear in our daily lives? Here are three key steps. Number one, meditate on God's word. The Bible is full of promises that combat fear. One of my favorites is Joshua chapter one, verse nine. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Read scriptures like this daily. Remind yourself of God's truth and fear will lose its grip on your heart. 
Number two, pray boldly. Prayer is not just asking God for things, it's an exchange. When you come to God in prayer, give him your fear and receive his peace. Philippians chapter four, verses six to seven tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number three, take action in faith. Fear tries to freeze you in place, but faith moves you forward. Whatever God is calling you to do, do it despite the fear. That's where real courage comes from. Not the absence of fear, but moving forward through it with the strength of God by your side. In conclusion, listen, I don't know what fears you're facing right now, but I do know this. God has already given you the power to overcome them. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You can live boldly, confidently, and courageously because God is with you. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So, don't let fear have the final word in your life. Instead, let faith rise up. Let God's promises lead the way. If this message has touched you, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone who needs to hear it. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell for more content that will strengthen your walk with Christ. Let's break free from fear together.